Hey, welcome to More Christ. Today I'm joined by Glenn Scrivener. Glenn is an ordained Church of England minister and evangelist who preaches Christ through writing, speaking, and online media. He's the director of and, and evangelist at Speak Life, an organization that exists to revive Christians, resource the church, and to reach out to the world with the good news of Jesus. So just to begin then, Glenn, can you tell us a little bit about your background and some of the key events in your life that really helped to form you? and your love for Christ and his church, ultimately. So I grew up in Australia. I was uh, part of a church going home. I'm the youngest of three kids. My sisters are quite a bit older than me. So I kind of, I basically had four mothers growing up. I think that formed me. <laughs> I had uh, too much older sisters and my mother and my, our grandmother lived with us. Um, and so, yeah, as I say, a church going home in a, in a sort of, uh anglican tradition that was very sort of very low church evangelical anglican and um i was a good kid i was a cute kid i was always trying to be the cute little brother um who was trying to perform for his sisters and their friends that was that was always um little glenn and then a big thing that happened to me aged 14 was um, my sisters had long moved out, but my dad got a job in Wales. And so we switched hemispheres with not very much notice. And uh, all of a sudden we were living in rural Wales and didn't know anybody. And um, so I was an Australian in, uh, yeah, in South Wales. And uh, I think my personality kind of, switched on a dime at that moment i think um if i read school reports from my australian days it was like glenn is uh, a joy and a delight and he's always working hard and doing extra credit assignments and and as soon as i went to the uk i discovered that 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 being or working hard is not valued <laughs> in in the uk uh sort of system and my personality switched on a dime as soon as i recognized that um looking like you're trying is almost the worst thing you could possibly do in a, in a British context. And so I did what every other Brit does and I pretended not to work and um, did that whole effortless superiority thing, um, which is um, not a great look, but it was, it, it got me by as a teenager. I think spiritually I was again, an earnest young boy who was told by, you know, I was told by my youth leaders to give my life to Jesus, which I did a thousand times in my teenage years. And I was constantly doing that. And that was, that was kind of the, my impression of what true spirituality is. There is a God who is waiting for you to give him your life. And so I obliged and I, I felt like I was holding up my end of the deal. But after I prayed, I didn't get a halo above, above my head or a funny feeling in my stomach or a light behind my eyes. And after the 998th time of praying, uh, I sort of gave up and thought, oh, well, God clearly doesn't want me, so I don't want him. I went away to Oxford to have as good a time as I could without God. Um, and I think through a series of events, the Lord kind of laid me on my back. And it's that old saying, isn't it? Sometimes you never look up until you're flat on your back. And I eventually said yes to a friend who'd been inviting me to church for three years. And I went to hate the preacher and I hated the preacher consistently every Sunday. Um, <laughs> but my friend also said, why don't you open up the Bible? And so we sort of had a look at the gospels together. And I, I do remember getting sort of halfway through Luke's gospel and thinking, um, ah, Jesus is great. Um, I, th I think my vision of God prior to that was that he was, you know, basically like electricity, just an impersonal power that would zap you. And if you're very clever, you could harness it for your, you know, for, for power in your life. Um, but then seeing Jesus himself was just a game changer. And by the, by the end of university, I decided to actually go back to Australia and, um, I was outwardly telling myself that I was wanting to try on being Australian, like try on that identity again <laughs> and figure that out. But on some level, and I, I, and I was aware of it at the time as well, on some level, I also wanted to detach myself from the life that I'd made and try on my Christian identity as well. And I think that, that was really important for that, actually going back to Sydney and threw myself into a church there and just devoured the Bible. And, um, and that was all 
all in the 1900s, Marcus. And <laughs> but I, I do remember New Year's Eve, 1999. By that stage, I was. I, I guess I could say I was soundly converted at that stage because I remember in Sydney they um, uh, for the fireworks for for New Year's Eve they put the word eternity onto Sydney Harbour Bridge. I don't know if you've heard this story, but there was a guy called Arthur Stace in Sydney who through the 60s and 70s, he wrote the word eternity on the pavements of Sydney. They reckon a million times. Interestingly, he he was basically a skid row drunk who came to Christ. He was illiterate, except for he taught himself how to write eternity in this sort of copper plate uh, font. And he did that a million times. And, and um, there are people to this day who say, like, he made them think about eternity and they went to church and they discovered Christ. And and funnily enough, um, whoever it was um, in Sydney decided that's that is the one word we're going to you know emblazon across Sydney Harbour Bridge, and so eternity kind of lights up at you know eleven fifty nine uh, on the thirty first of December nineteen ninety nine. And my friend who was with me, we were, we were sort of watching this on the on the harbour front, and he just puts his hands in the air and says, "Jesus is eternity," <laughs> and I was like. Jesus. And at that moment, as I, as I kind of also yelled out Jesus, I thought, ah, you got me. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> Roundly converted by then, I would say. Yeah. Brilliant. Kind of surprised by eternity, like surprised by Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing, Glenn. And um, what then brought you to London and how did you get involved with Speak Life, which you're involved with now? And I suppose ultimately, what do you hope it achieves then? So from there, I sort of, I worked in the sort of the civil service, they call it the public service in Australia for a bit. And then um, I um, found a job at All Souls Laying on Place, which was just basically as an intern, kind of vacuuming the the carpets and cleaning the loos and polishing the brass. But you also got to sit down next to John Stott for lunch, um, author of 40 books and uh, a, a towering kind of figure in in the church in the 20th century and um so it, like his influence was was very formative richard buse was the rector back then he was an absolute statesman in the in the global church at that time rico tice is a, a famous evangelist over here in the uk he was on staff at the time and paul blackham was an incredible is an incredible uh, theologian and pastor and that was an incredibly formative time for me and then give or take the odd deportation I, I sort of went back to australia and back to the uk and back to australia and back to the uk but um i got married to my wife emma uh, who was at oxford with me but uh long story about you know how how she came to faith herself um we eventually went for ordination training and i went to um we both went to Oak Hill theological college in north london and i was ordained in the church of england in 2007 and uh, came down to Eastbourne, which is where I live now, and uh, did a curacy, which in the Anglican setup is you're sort of like a vicar, um, a, a church pastor with your L plates on. And I did that for three years. And then there was a, a charity here in Eastbourne, an evangelistic charity that was looking for an evangelist. And I, I, I got that job in 2010. And my boss retired in 2015. We rebranded and became Speak Life. And so, yeah, f since 2010, I've been here at Speak Life, and, and we really want to evangelize the church and the world with the good news of Jesus. And I say we evangelize the church and the world because I think it it's meant to happen in that order. I think if the church is not very good at reaching out with the good news of Jesus, and, and sometimes we're terrible at it, it's because we don't know it because we've forgotten the goodness of Jesus, the power of Jesus, the love of Jesus. Jesus said, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, verse 34. And that's kind of a theme verse for, for our charity, that we, we really think if we are not bubbling over with an effervescent faith that is contagious, it's probably a heart problem. It's probably, at, at which point, the bigger problem than the world not knowing Jesus is that the church doesn't know Jesus. And so in all that we try to do, we try to evangelize the church that the church might evangelize the world. And so social media is brilliant in that way because that's how social media works too. You, you know, you don't have a message that reaches the world. You have a message that reaches your followers. And then if they like it, 
they share it. And if those people like it, they share it. And that's what virality is. And so interestingly, social media works exactly the same way the mission of Christ works, which is you don't make you don't make messages create content um, that is for the world in the abstract. You actually go to those who ought to like your stuff best and you enthuse them and they overflow and they overflow and it's a ripple effect and out it goes. And so the the match between Speak Life and wanting to be a Christian ministry and us getting onto social media is uh, it really works well for us. And we're, we're just we're just trying to make some noise for Jesus, whether in person or online, so that the church is evangelized and the, and the church evangelizes the world. Beautiful. Thanks for that, Glenn. And um, you mentioned a few names there. Uh, I'm interested in if you're if you want to go down that route and hearing more about those and what was especially inspirational or influential about those in your life, whether that be academic ones that you mentioned or personal. And um, as a second part of that question or a separate question altogether, we might look at someone like Tom Holland's influence on your work, which I could be wrong, but it seems that he's pr provided some influence on you in the sense that um, he's written this wonderful book dominion and he's shown how radical the impact of christ has been on kind of western civilization so to speak and transfigured our assumptions and doubly that element of speaking to the church that you just mentioned i think he has seen a, a, in, a, in a different way maybe or maybe a very maybe it's the same way that we need to return to the weirdness and mm. don't uh, conceal the weirdness of the church and trying to reach the world in the abstract and so on, as you suggest. Would you like to speak to maybe some of those points? I think what Tom Holland has helped us all to see is that it's it's possible to say the stuff that lots of Christians have been saying and to be heard um, by the world. So in, in lots of ways, one of the one of the first um, influences that put me onto the track that helped me to write The Air We Breathe, which, you know, <laughs> the the short uh, description of my book from last year, The Air We Breathe, is it's Dominion for Dummies and I'm the Dummy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dominion, that great book that, that Tom Holland wrote. Um, but, you know, my, my book, The Air We Breathe, is sort of in the works since at least 2011, when it was the two, it was the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible back in 2011, and lots of people were doing lots of things to sort of talk about the impact of um, the Bible on the modern world. And I read a book by Vishal Mangalwadi, uh, an Indian thinker and writer, and and um, his journey to Christian faith was really um, asking the question in India: Why was the West so odd and prosperous? And he came to the conclusion that so many others um, outside the church and inside the church have, have discovered, which is it's it's absolutely Christianity. This is this is the Jesus revolution that has upended all our assumptions. And his book, the book that made your world, um, was absolutely influential. I, I, that sort of started me on this track, and I loved reading Larry Seidentop's book, Inventing the Individual, which sort of talks about from a political philosophy point of view. Why do we have this liberal tradition at all? And um, absolutely, it's it's just Christianity that has given us these things. Or you think of uh, Rodney Stark, who started his journey from a very secular point of view and became uh, more and more Christian as he went on in, in life. But he would write books about the rise of Christianity and then another book about the, the triumph of Christianity. That was delicious to read. And mm -hmm. um David Bentley Hart, um, an Orthodox theologian and historian, uh, wrote a book called Atheist Delusions. And that that's a very <laughs> like if you want if you want a version of Dominion that is really spicy um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if 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 Tom Holland's book is is more uh, if Tom Holland's book is is more like morphine with a sort of a, a, a long, slow <laughs> high, then. <laughs> I, I think uh, atheist delusions is cocaine. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, and I, I loved all these books, um, but not a lot of them were sort of making headlines. Not a lot of them were making waves in the secular world, but, but absolutely Dominion has in 2019 um, out it came. And I remember giving um, Dominion to my father-in-law, who's a history buff um, wasn't a wasn't a believer at the, at the time and i thought this is ideal because he loves history 
this will sort of nudge him towards Christian faith, perhaps, but it it still sits on his bookshelf <laughs> at at home. And so I, I remember thinking, I, w- I would like to get into his hands a, a, a book of a of a size that he would sort of pick up and read. And so, you know, hence Dominion for Dummies. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Glenn. And I, I most appreciate that book too. The Air We Breathe, How We All Came to Believe in Freedom, Kindness, Progress and Equality. Great title too. And um, I'd love to speak a bit more about that recent book. I think it speaks to some of the the central issues that we really do have to wrestle with it maybe especially in the english speaking parts of the world and like you i was most impressed by uh, dr shal mangalwadi's book on the how the bible changed our world and uh, what's interesting too i spoke with nancy pierce just the other day and um i think she's one of my favorite scholars ever and Oz Guinness before that, and fruit that seems to have come from Le Brie with some of these figures and the books they've written is remarkable. So if we're to judge the Le Brie by its fruit, it seems pretty remarkable. And um, now just moving to your book, I suppose, you begin with this humorous story, which really uh, highlights, I think, the ignorance of the Christian faith in much popular culture and um, its, its impact that we discussed before before delving into things like the symbolism of the cross and this kind of radical impact, as we say, of the Christian story in our world. Can you tell us a bit about that and why you think it's important, again, to wrestle with this strange history then? Mm. Is that the Alex Amanos graffiti? Is that what you're referring to? or In the the, the art museum where they're like, um, the, the history of crucifixions <laughs> and nothing. <Yeah. laughs> right, right. So, yeah, there's a... Um... A tweeter who who went through the uh, the National Gallery in London in 2017 and came out and and, and they just tweeted I I just whizzed through the the Western Art section of the National Gallery I can summarize it in seven words a thousand years of crucifixions then stripes <laughs> um, and and of course that's a, a, a grotesque oversimplification of the history of Western Art but it gets at something it gets at something <laughs> that. For a thousand years plus, we've been painting this image above all images. Um, and to say that death by torture is subversive as art is one thing, and it is. You know, it's so interesting that, that back in the um, early part, you know, back in the early part of the 20th century, um, Duchamp's um, urinal. Um, was this like absolutely subversive piece of art and the sort of the, the birth of, of modern art uh, as sort of utterly mold breaking and people are like, Oh my goodness, a urinal. And, and, and in more recent years, there's been, uh, was it a Dutch painter that did, or was it an installation that was piss Christ? Um, and, and so I like a, a crucifix covered in piss and people are like, Oh, that's so transgressive. Like, no, it's got, <laughs> it's got nothing on the transgressive subversion that the cross actually is because um, absolutely a God on a cross um, stripped naked and choking to death in the open air to, to die by torture. That, that that's like a urinal has got nothing on that, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. And it, and if you, if you happen to urinate on that <laughs> image, you're not adding anything to the subversive quality of, of that piece of art, because it, it is, it's already plumbed that depth. You cannot go deeper. You can like, because that's, that's God on that cross who's been stripped naked and is dying an excruciating, agonizing death. The, the kind of death that was so unspeakable that Romans said, you know, the cross should never be on the lips of a Roman citizen. So what kind of God descends to actually die upon it? It's so, the idea that we can whiz through the National Gallery and and take in scene after scene after scene of death by torture and then go, ah, sacred art. <laughs> like, mm. Something has happened to us. <laughs> the, fa- the, f- the fact that the most subversive artists in the world think that they are being transgressive by urinating on such an image just goes to show that some somehow the cross has become so domesticated that people think, oh, we need to add a layer of profanity to it in order to be subversive. Like, no, it, it already is the most profane image imaginable. 
the idea that it, it had ever been sacred art is yeah. the thing that really needs explaining. And so in a sense, the whole book is an explanation of how it is that we can walk through the Western art section of the National Gallery and simply let images of a crucified God wash over us. Um, that can only be because the cross has become the air we breathe that the the teaching of the cross the teaching of christ and him crucified has become so basic so obvious so universal so natural to us that we no longer notice it but that is not a testimony to um how obscure the cross is to our way of thinking that is only a testimony to to how all pervasive the cross is to our way of thinking mm -hmm. and so in a, in a sense i'm trying to desensitize and then resensitize <laughs> us to the cross to the message at the heart of christianity which is god on that cross and one way to do that is to take us out of our little bubble and immerse us in a different kind of culture and so let's go back two thousand years and let's try and understand what the cross would have meant to an ancient roman and one of the things i do is discuss the alexamenos graffiti which is um, the first artistic depiction of crucifixion it's not just the first um, artistic depiction of sacred um, art. It's not just the first um, depiction of Christ on the cross. It's just the first depiction of crucifixion, full stop. Because no one wants to, no one wants to memorialize um, these slaves who are choking to death. And so, in the second century, they reckon um, scratched into the plaster wall of the Palatine Hill, um, someone has did, done this little graffito, and it's got. Um, a figure on the cross it's it's clearly christ except that he has the the head of a donkey and next to this crucified donkey of a god is alex Amenos, and he's raising his hand in veneration and the caption just says alex Amenos worships his god and it's so derisive like it's so sarcastic yeah. and it's so biting even over two thousand years it still bites you're like mm -hmm. anyone who worships a donkey of a god is just like a fool and a knave and an idiot and a moron and so i think we need to leave the national gallery and put ourselves into the sandals of whoever that artist was that was you know um doing the alex Amenos graffiti in order to to get a measure of the difference christianity has made like how do we go from the alex Amenos graffiti to the sacred art of the National Gallery. And in a sense, it's a 2000 year journey. And, um, and that's what I try to trace out. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Glenn. There's so many things I love about that. I love this deconstruction of our chronological snobbery. I think return us to that sense of wonder, which is something I love about Chesterton and figures like that. And as I said, that radical thing. And I think it's a really interesting moment now that we're sort of breaking up out of those simplistic kind of polarities, say conservative and liberal and so on. And there's this focus on the radical Christian faith coming into the mainstream where with figures like, like Paul Kingsworth, who we mentioned, and uh, it's an exciting time. And I'm grateful that you've played your part in that. And um, one, or one particular element of the book, which I think is most apropos to the current moment, is um, when you focus upon equality. So when many people think about equality, they think it's like this relatively recent notion on its existence to the Enlightenment, probably at the earliest for many people. Maybe, could you tell us a little bit what's wrong with that tale that people tell and what might we learn about equality in a more integrated Christian context? Then? I think people either think that equality um, is a recent development or equality is just obvious and natural. And it's, it's, and if you would only, you know, look at the data fairly, you would come up with some kind of notion of the, of the equal dignity and value of all people in the eyes of the law, or in the eyes of God. And so like for people who think that it's obvious, you know, for, for people, <laughs> here, here's, here's how those two, um, uh, false notions come together in the, in the Declaration of Independence, right? So you've got you've got Thomas Jefferson framing this, and um, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. 
Um, what's, what's interesting is that when Thomas Jefferson wrote that, um, his original line was, um, we hold these truths to be uh, sacred and um, inviolable or something like that. Sacred and inviolable. Let's, let's go with that. It's sacred and something, but it's something like that. We hold these truths to be sacred and inviolable. And he sent it to his friend, Benjamin Franklin, um, for an edit. And the only thing I think that, that uh, Franklin um, made a note on was, oh, it's clumsy to have um, sacred and inviolable. Let's just say self-evident. And so Benjamin Franklin's contribution to the Declaration of Independence was to say that equality is self-evident. Now, interestingly, um, ni neither of them were, you know, Christian in um, in any sort of confessional sense. Jefferson was a Unitarian, um, but not even he could deny that that equal rights are a sacred value. Um, Franklin kind of thought thought we need to found our concept of equality on something more certain than religion we need to found it on reason and so that's why he said we hold these truths to be self-evident and so that that might be where sort of people come along and, and just say oh it's an enlightenment idea um thank your lucky stars that we we now believe in the self-evident equality of all people but you just want to kind of sit benjamin franklin down and just say well in what sense is equality self-evident if i measure any two people by any one metric i'm going to discover difference this person is smarter than this person this person's more uh, economically productive than this person this person is stronger faster this person is a man this person's a woman this person is a citizen this person is an alien or uh, this person is a master, this person's a slave. And never forget that Thomas Jefferson had 600 slaves um, as he writes about the self-evident equality of all people. Um, and so what it, what is it that's actually self-evident about equality? And I think modern thinkers like Yuval Noah Harari will will see things a lot more clearly because they, they will say, um, cut a person open, look inside, You'll see the heart, the lungs, the you know neurons firing. What you won't see is anything called rights. You can map a human's DNA, but that doesn't spell out the the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, where do these rights come from? And even Jefferson thought they were sacred. Even Jefferson thought that they were um, uh, through the Bible, as does Yuval Noah Harari, as does Tom Holland. Um, and the, the idea that you can simply read the equality of all people off the data is absurd. And, you know, I mean, what, what, what scientific uh, experiment are you going to do that's going to uh, grant the equal moral worth and dignity of all peoples? What logical argument are you going to make? Um, and people sort of say, well, what about Immanuel Kant? And didn't, didn't he have a go and talking about the categorical imperative and you know, we, sh we should act in such a way that it, it becomes a rule for all peoples? Um, Kant could only do that in the Enlightenment once the individual had been invented through the Christian Revolution, mm -hmm. <laughs> through this whole idea that we are souls before the living God, that we are you know, in the church, brothers and sisters, and there's no Lord except Christ. And um, only through like Christendom and it's um, the evolution of a rights language that the canon lawyers had had sort of developed over hundreds of years. You you need all of that to even get to the sense of the individual that Immanuel Kant has as this already kind of inviolable person who already has dignity, who then starts to reason um, in in this sort of sense. So the you don't reason your way to equality. You've got to assume it. It's a faith position. And at that stage, I just want to say to all my secular friends who think that they are not believers, no, you already are a believer. You don't need to take a leap of faith. You're already you know, six feet in the air. What you really need is some ground beneath your feet. Reason doesn't do it. Jefferson had the right idea the first time around. It's a sacred value. But you don't just need to leap up to this sacred value and just, just take it on faith that we're all equal. It's actually grounded in the God who's made us in his image 
and God the Son, who has become God our brother and earthed himself into our humanity, risen up again from the lowest place to the highest to invite us into a, his family so that we are all equals before God. There are reasons for why we can believe in human equality. Um, but those reasons are reasons of faith. It's faith-seeking understanding. It's not reason in the abstract sense that Be Benjamin Franklin thought. So I hope that when I when I talk to my friends who don't consider themselves to be believers, I can convince them, A, you already are a believer. How about human rights? How about equality? Don't you believe in these things? But B, actually, the more reasonable way to hold that view is to believe in Jesus. So that, that's the argument I try to take people on. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you, Glenn. And um, that has certainly been my experience as well, coming from more secularist background and seeing after the fact these uh, notions of progress and all these things that we take for granted. I remember some of my notions growing up would have, I would have had a faith in the political order and socialism and so on. And it was only through coming to Christ and reading books like um, the historian Christopher Lash's history of progress, the true and only heaven, that that sort of deconstructed in me. So I, I appreciate that about your work. And um, I'm curious how this relates now to two dominant tribes, so to speak. Like like you said, people, many people have this um, element of faith, this hermeneutic position that they start off with. So one would be on the side of equity and so on. And you see this probably typified, although they, they intersect and overlap in different ways. You see this typified in some ways by woke, uh, quote unquote, people. And then you have this kind of new right position, this kind of Nietzschean neo-paganism, which is more of a war of all against all notion. And uh, they recognize an order in nature and so on, but they fall into that trap. I wonder how does a Christian understanding avoid collapsing into this kind of maybe suffocating notion of equity where we all must end up in the same position it must be mandated through the government or corporations or whatever it may be and the kind of Nietzsche insight does that make sense yeah absolutely it does and I, and I think because of the success of the Jesus revolution um, certain Christian assumptions have become the air that we breathe so that even if either of those sides have never set foot inside a church in their lives. They are thoroughly schooled in certain of the values that Jesus has taught. I go through seven values in the book. I talk about equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. And those become sort of transcendent values in our kingdom without a king. So without Christ, those values become divorced from Christ and divorced from one another, but they do become sort of faith positions that we just take for granted. And so you can't talk about equality without everybody saying, amen, brother, <laughs> <laughs> but in a secular sense, right? And so we're all just hurling Bible verses at each other. Uh, we've just forgotten the references. And in devolving from a Christian understanding of things, I think Christianity holds together so many different things, but let me let me point to two things that Christianity holds together, which is nature and grace. So nature kind of the way things are, but they tend to um, fall and get twisted and perverted and, and fall into a certain kind of selfishness. And then there's grace, which is a kind of an intervention, a supernatural intervention in order to raise nature up to better than it deserves so if, if nature is all about dessert um grace is about equalizing things and making and giving you better than what you deserve in the gospel um you you cannot break these two things apart because the word became flesh you know the supernatural one became flesh earthed himself to our humanity earthed himself to nature in order to plumb the depths of our of our nature and our sin, dying the slave's death at the bottom of the heap and rising again to be Lord of all, inviting us into his family. But when he rises again, he doesn't leave behind his body. He doesn't leave behind his humanity. He doesn't leave behind nature. Nature and grace remain united in the gospel. 
when you step away from Jesus, those those two things sort of come apart. And those on the left tend to go with grace untethered from nature. And so an intervention that equalizes all things so that that you know all people um all people can sit down at the feast together and everyone's got a seat at the table and, and all that kind of stuff except it's less of a feast now and, in, and instead of everyone having a, the same place around the table everyone is able to get equally high up their own individual ladder right <laughs> very different vision of what equality looks like not we are all integrated into a family and a feast um, shoulder to shoulder around the table, enjoying oneness. Um, far more, it's does everybody have the same? And and so there's, there's that sort of vision of, of of equity that sort of happens. Um, but then when you when you have that, and when you want to have this intervention that equalizes the stuff that people have, well, there's going to be a significant number of people who are going to say hands off my stuff bud mm. and what about liberty you're, you're giving me this equality stuff what about what about liberty what about my freedom what about my choice what about my my autonomy and um and you're going to have that more kind of right wing position um which emphasizes the, the you know the um the individual and the autonomy of the individual and um and we don't need to have all the same stuff. It's it's a war of all and all because you know that's that's the way that their brand of individualism kind of kind of takes them, and they're more the nature people, right? And you know, and nature absolutely was noticing that nature doesn't teach you about equality, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, it certainly doesn't teach you about compassion. Um, compassion is more the sort of the value that sort of. Um, is named by uh those those on the left and 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 sort of liberty and 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 freedom is is sort of more named by those on the right um but what we what we really want is the integration of these things and what we really want to do is critique the the atomization and the individualism that has fed into both of these things and and get people back to the to, to feasting around the table as brothers and sisters rather than as soon as you secularize that and we're not we're no longer brothers and sisters in the church we're citizens in the polis in 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 this political reality and then it becomes a grab for stuff um and and there are some trying to get the grace thing done <laughs> in a christless kingdom and there are some people um trying to earth themselves to, to, to nature and, and respect nature, but without that gracious redemption. And that's, that's kind of the war that we're in. And, and what I'm suggesting by saying come to Christ is I'm not suggesting a middle path. I'm not being centrist dad here. <laughs> if, if it's, it's not like, it's not like there's the, there's left wing and right wing and those are givens. And then let's try and meet in the middle. It's like, you know what? These two things have devolved from this thing up here. Um, and can we return to this thing up here, which is not in the middle between mm -hmm. those two options, but is, I think, the the original from which those other things have devolved. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you for that, Lane. And you sound like my friend, Jonathan Pajo. <laughs> what, what you just described there. That, that's most I did of a triangle. He's always doing a triangle. <laughs> mountain Marcus it's a mountain. <laughs> oh my goodness that's fantastic thank you Glenn now it reminds me a lot too of um I've, as I mentioned before I'm particularly deeply indelibly impressed at least I hope by GK Chesterton and his notion of the virtues run amok and it sounds like that's what you're describing and nice. um I, I was also struck quite forcefully by Ivan Illich's The Corruption of Christianity and he's got this beautiful conception of the corruption of the best is the worst. I think that a uh, lens wonderful merit to your point. And um, I think we all would do well to, to wrestle with that and take it seriously. And um, 
you mentioned compassion there, so I want to return to that, and I want to look at um, that, I suppose, again, in contrast to this more nebulous notion of this kind of love for humanity. This compassion is incarnational. You have to get out and do it. Um, would you like to speak to that and what you learned in your studies about the nature and history of compassion and why it is so important for the Christian life then? I think I've got a newfound appreciation for the Good Samaritan as as I've thought more and more about it in the context of history and just, just trying to imagine how the parable of the Good Samaritan is heard by various people. And so as you look at ancient cultures, if, um, if Jesus was telling the story, or rather if Aesop was telling the story of the Good Samaritan, it would probably run something along the lines of once upon a time, there was some guy who was out late at night in a part of town he shouldn't have been in. He got beaten up and left for dead. Idiot. <laughs> Don't be like that, moron. Okay? And that's, that's I mean, that, 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 that is kind of so much of ancient thinking is about, you know, there is a really cruel hierarchy of being. Know your place. Don't get ideas above your station or things will come a cropper, you know, and, and that's it's very much um, know your place is is sort of the wisdom, and you think of something like stoicism as well. Um, uh, so much of that is just working within your limits, and there's the limits of mortality, and there's the limits of of you being finite and whatever, and and um, cut your cloth to that. Think think your way into the limits that you have. Don't don't burst those bonds. Um, or else you're going against the grain of nature. You'll get splinters, you know. And so so an Aesop's fable is is very much, um, yeah, people get beaten up. Try not to be that guy. Um, then put yourself into the, the sandals of a, a, a Jewish person listening to the story. The guy gets beaten up, and then the, the priest goes by, and he's got a job to do. And the law is very clear about things that make that priest clean and make that priest unclean. And very few of Jesus' hearers would have thought that there was much wrong with what the priest did. And then comes the Levite, who is another member of the priestly caste, and he passes the guy by on the other side of the, uh, of the road. And, and justice is, in that understanding, justice is about obeying the law, and and sticking to the orders that have that have been given to you, and when you put yourself into the sandals of an ancient person, it's it's really hard. It's really hard emotionally to um, to inhabit that world, because instinctively, when we see these people pass on by on the other side of the road, we know that's the worst thing in the world. They weren't compassionate. Are you kidding me? That is that is the worst thing in the world. Um, at the time of recording, um, two days ago, Arsenal Football Club put out a video of a young girl. She must have been like eight, nine years old. And she was visiting Arsenal on a game day versus West Ham. And she and her dad got a, a shirt and all the Arsenal players like signed her shirt for, for her. And... Um, the video is less than two minutes long and it's had nearly 10 million views. <laughs> it's only been up for a couple of days. Um, why has it had nearly 2 million views? Because everyone has been quote tweeting this video and they are all appalled that none of the players looked her in the eye or spoke to her. They only signed her shirt and they, you know, most of them had earphones in and they were listening to whatever they're listening to on Spotify, their eye of the tiger playlist and get, getting into their, <laughs> getting into their game mode. <laughs> And, and, you know, and obviously their agents sort of, you know, said, Hey, go and sign this girl's shirt. And so what, what? Okay. And so they go and they go and sign the shirt and off they go, but no one paid mind to the little person in their midst. No one was gracious. No one was compassionate. Nobody stooped to say hello, to be personable, to share their face with this little girl. And like the, the the amount of outrage that people have at these footballers who had a job to do, and all, you know, like, but an ancient person would not understand the outrage. An ancient person would just be like, "They've got a job to do. Of course, they walk on by on the other side. Of course, they're like, <laughs> no harm, no foul. What did they do wrong? Show me the transgression." 
And yet, you know, literally 10 million views of people getting outraged at this because they're basically watching the priest and the Levi walk by on the other side of the road. Right? <laughs> and that's, but that's how ancient people would think, you know, no harm, no foul. I, I just finished reading a, a book by um, uh, Sharon Dirks and uh, she uh, has written a book called Broken Planet. And she just shares a whole bunch of stories of people who lived through natural disasters and whether it's the Haiti earthquake or the Boxing Day tsunami or um, various hurricanes that have happened. And, and very interestingly, in, in other parts of the world where these things happen, um, she um, basically asks aid workers, you know, what was it like being out there? And they all testified how difficult it, it is in those cultures to raise money for relief from those natural disasters because in those cultures they're all like well Allah seems to have willed their judgment why would I help again mm -hmm. um, or if you have a karmic view of the world you know well they get you know there's there's dessert happening who are we to intervene and that's just a very natural way to think and it's it's a majority view around the world today and it's an absolutely the majority view of people around the world down through history that when you see the person beat up by the side of the road, well, maybe fate has decreed he be there. Maybe his village excluded him for a very good reason. Maybe the gods want him there. Maybe Allah has decreed it. Who are you to intervene? And then comes the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan intervenes. And this this is what is... This is what is amazing about grace. Grace comes into nature and disrupts. And grace takes it upon itself to, um, to reorder something that you find naturally. And, and that, that is, there is the revolutionary aspect of Christianity. That, you know, that, that, that is why Tom Holland looks at Christianity and calls it the most disruptive, the most influential, the most enduring revolution in human history. Um, there is an intervention that comes in and says that princes should be cast down from their thrones and the lowly are lifted up, right? Mm -hmm. And the last should be first and the first should be last. And there's, there is this equalizing tendency within Christianity. And there is this compassionate drive to move towards the weak and the lowly and the and the marginalized and the the last and the lost and 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 that's what the good samaritan embodies and of course the good samaritan is christ basically in the story you know he has compassion that's the that's the word that is used of the good samaritan it's the word that is most associated with jesus's emotional state you know in the in the gospels no one else is said to have compassion it's this word that means gut-wrenching pity stomach churning love and and it's applied to the Good Samaritan. I think the Good Samaritan is basically Jesus in disguise. He's one from outside the system who comes into the system and disrupts it and causes an intervention. And he has this gut-wrenching mercy and compassion and picks the guy up and pours the oil and the wine in and takes him to the inn. Why does he take him to an inn? Because there were no such thing as hospitals. Christians hadn't gotten around to inventing them yet. Mm -hmm. But they would. And they would because of this story and more specifically because of this storyteller who himself, you know, comes and plunges himself into our mess and rises up again to invite us into a reordered reality in which there is this supernatural value called compassion. And I, I call it supernatural because, well, nature is about the survival of the fittest and the sacrifice of the weakest but here comes the fittest christ who is sacrificed for us the weakest so that we the weakest might survive and not just survive but thrive and be invited into his family and invited into his movement of compassion and on these ripple effects of compassion go and and you get the 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 invention of charity in the form that we understand charity to be and you get the invention of orphanages and you get the invention of, of hospitals and, and, and education for all starts to, you know, starts to be this principle and, and moving out towards the weak and the poor. And, and, and then in the middle ages, this, this kind of conception that, you know what, the poor, it's not just that the rich have an obligation to give to the poor, it's the poor have a right to provision and protection from the rich they in themselves there is an inviolable dignity to them and it, and it all it all starts with this compassion revolution 
um, that Jesus has, has brought to the world, but it's utterly disruptive, isn't it? And, and I don't think I'd, I'd really framed it in my thinking as clearly as I did, as I was especially thinking about the Good Samaritan, this, this concept of compassion. Compassion is an intervention. It is supernatural. It is disruptive. It is revolutionary. And this has been the, the genius of the Christian revolution, actually. It's all, but it's also why divorced from Christ, you get this revolutionary impulse that can rumble on and rumble on and nothing is safe from that universal acid. And so we really, we really do need to tether this to Christ himself. No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Glenn. And um, what you described there, I think is interesting also because there's a, there's a, this renewal, as I mentioned, this kind of neo-paganism and Nietzscheanism, uh, even like my fellow Irish people have got into this now. Um, there's one YouTuber who who thinks in very Nietzschean lines that I'll not name them, but um, th there's this basic conception of uh, the big thing beats the strong thing. It's all very simple. It's all about the will, the power, but it, it doesn't even work at the kind of animal level, as I think Jordan Peterson talks about, when you get these more iterated games, even within um, groups of uh, chimpanzees and things like that, they will have a more nuanced hierarchy. It's not just the, the chimp dictating what that, what's going to happen to, to the rest of them, because over time he'll be taken out. But if he plays a more iterated game, then a... Uh, that's that system is longer lasting so it seems that the the big thing and the small thing and the big thing looking after the small thing is a more uh, it's a lot more iterated game than just the the little thing on its own or just the, the big thing on its own which i think is interesting um so there's not this strict a only grace or only nature to your point that it's a mixture of the two again it's the, the greatest good for the greatest number for the greatest time which is eternity itself and so on and um i think that, that was just as you're speaking i thought that was interesting too but for so peterson i think is interesting for many christians like me because he's brought folks to see those more nuanced points and he's even brought people I know to Christ. So even though I'll, there's a lot of criticism of him, I give him the benefit of the doubt for the most part for those reasons. And I think you have done a wonderful do job in commenting on his work and gently critiquing where you think he's gone wrong and so on. So in your book, you have this chapter on consent and you've spoken about this recently in response to Dr. Peterson's conversation with Louise Parry, for example. And you acknowledge that it has many good points, but you suggest, you suggest that ultimately it's not enough. Um, why is that? And what other virtues must we surround things like consent with to offer this more integrated and um, distinctly Christian perspective? If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so moving the conversation to to consent, which is the the sort of third value that I talk about in the book, and um, so equality and I especially major on Genesis and the Old Testament and then compassion and I major on Christ and the Gospels and then consent I, I major on the early church because I'm I'm also doing a history from Genesis to George Floyd as well as going through the seven values and consent is is really to talk about the the Christian sexual revolution because when you think about the sexual revolution you you usually think of the swinging 60s, 60s and I want to take us back 1900 years before the swinging 60s to the revolution that actually built our moral sensibilities about sex and sexuality and marriage and family um and Jesus comes and brings an an incredible equality to the sexes when in Matthew 19 he he just basically says it's either marriage between a man and a woman for life or you can be a eunuch for the kingdom. Um, and like, that's pretty stark. Um, and I, I, I always think back to the, the line that Joseph Henrik uses about uh, Christianity's marriage and family program. He, say, he says it reached down and grabbed men by the testicles. Um, <laughs> because it's absolutely, he is restraining and restricting and training male sexuality in a way that was unprecedented. In the ancient world, you know, elite men desired whoever they wanted and they got whoever they wanted. And there's no sense of, of like bodily autonomy or choice or consent in any of that. And there was no sense of equality of the sexes. What um, what 
um, modesty meant um, in the sexual realm for a woman was um, absolute, you know, chastity, virg virginity before marriage, and then, you know, ab absolute fidelity within marriage. They probably wouldn't have to wait long because marriages at 12 were very common. Um, so that's what it meant for a, a, a woman, modesty, which is the, the the thing you are aiming for in your sexuality. For, for men, it, it, it meant um, not being excessive in your lusts. Don't go to the brothel too often, right? <laughs> because that was effeminate. That's, that was sort of the, the ancient thinking. Um, but there was an absolute double standard. And Jesus says, no, we want absolute equality. And so men have to be as restricted as women had always uh, been expected to be. And they are to train their sexuality in marriage. Um, or if not in marriage, be a eunuch for the kingdom and actually live for Jesus in a way that can you know, transcend your sexual desires, which is a, a really stark statement into an ancient world where your, your real hope at a legacy beyond death was your progeny. Um, and so he, he's like saying, well, no, because you trust in, you trust in Jesus, you trust for eternity, right? You don't, you don't need progeny. You can, you can work for the kingdom. And so there's that radical aspect to Christ's teaching on, on sex that he gives this incredibly dignified space to singleness I, I think so there's that position for, for singleness but then there's marriage and that's the one place for, for sexual expression says Jesus says that says the Christian tradition and uh, I, I love Kyle Harper a historian who wrote uh, from shame to sin about Jesus's sexual revolution and he says all the diffuse erotic energy of the world is to be cramped into one frail sacred union and that's that's the Christian sexual ethic to restrict, restrain, and train, especially male sexuality, and tie the man to his woman and tie him to his offspring. Because there's nothing in nature that ties a man to his offspring. Right? Pregnancy ties a woman to her offspring. The man is not so encumbered by nature. You have to have something gracious. You have to have something from outside nature to train and restrain the man. And marriage is it, you know, and and so this this huge view of of lifelong monogamy between man and woman um, starts to be the incubator for all sorts of things. I could talk about how it's the incubator actually for a belief in freedom, and that there's actually such a thing as a libertarian free will. There's actually, there's actually um, the early church started to believe that because they could resist this natural bent and drive towards human reproduction. They, they could actually be virgins. Um, and be, they could actually be virgins and they could actually be martyrs. They could resist sex and they could resist their fear of death. They were the freest people on the planet. No one had ever seen anything like Christians precisely because they were virgins and they were martyrs. And it was the most anti Greco-Roman thought in the world because the you know the Greeks especially like believed in the fates and there's you know there's absolutely nothing you can do and Christians were like oh yeah you can kill me and I've still got eternity um, I could be a eunuch for the kingdom and I'll have children in the kingdom forever they were the freest people so it it absolutely like birthed this notion of freedom it birthed this notion of equality because you know the double standard was taken away and it birthed this notion of consent. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul says, um, the wife belongs to the husband and the husband belongs to the wife. And everyone in the ancient world thought the first thing and nobody thought the second thing. Everyone thought the wife belonged to the husband. Nobody thought that the husband belonged to the wife. And that they should not deny each other except for a time to devote themselves to prayer. And when they come together, it is by mutual consent. And so within the context of the covenant relationship of marriage, consent grows up as this this thing and and um and you know love marriages rather than arranged marriages grew out of this understanding because it this is not a political alliance this is a covenant relationship of unbreakable love and from the love relationship comes this this idea that i'm a person you're a person I don't belong to you more than you belong to me, but we both belong to one another and we are to come together. And that is always to be a gift and, and not something that is simply claimed.
And so consent becomes incredibly important in the Christian sexual ethic. In the culture, um, pederasty had been thought of in the Greco-Roman world as um, this thing to be celebrated. And everybody was talking about, you know, pederasty as the, it's a word that means child love in Greek. But it was uh, an older male initiating children into the ways of sex and sexuality. And it was celebrated as pederasty. The Christians and the Jews called it pedophoria, which means child destruction. Um, largely because, okay, it's, 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 sex outside of this covenant relationship and it's consent it's sex outside of consent and it's destruction and it's harmful and the, this suddenly becomes a category for sexual abuse which i mean lots of abuse was happening all the time but there was no category for it it was an invisible crime it was an invisible sin it was an egregious but invisible sin you need certain categories to actually um to actually have a me too movement right <laughs> If you if you if you want to see the egregious evil of um, domination and exploitation in the realm of sex, then you need to have views that human bodies are much more like temples than they are like playgrounds, and that marriage is this cosmic kind of presentation of these eternal gospel truths and like the romance between Christ and the church and. You need to think that sex is significant and you need to think that male and female are, are different but equal and you need to you, you need to think that sex is a proclamation rather than recreation and things like this and 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 so what I, what I love about what Tom Holland you know did at the end of Dominion is point to the me too movement and just sort of say hang on why are we uh, outraged at a Harvey Weinstein we ought to be but why you know and like it's surely because he's transgressing he he's transgressing some profoundly christian notions of what sex really is and and therefore pressing into that issue of consent and why why that is important actually gets you to some really profound issues about the human person but more than that about about equality and about about god actually i, I don't think you can have a proper conversation about consent without having a conversation about god so that's that's why i go there well, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Len. And um, I'm just looking at the clock, and I, I would, I love the your answers to these questions, and I love the book. But I'm just cognizant that I don't want to take too much of your time, so I will not go through all of the chapters of the book. But I highly recommend that people read it. But um, that's something I would love to speak with you about if you're interested uh, with further conversation or whether you want to do that in person, as we mentioned before we started recording and um, alongside some of those other figures we mentioned, or uh, I think that would be fantastic. But um, it seems to, with that in mind, it seems to me that we've moved into this really interesting post-secular space recently, maybe I'm wrong with this, but it seems to go beyond that kind of post-liberalism of a few years ago. And there's a lot more talk of things like powers and principalities and the notions that um, that people are kind of primarily rational seems to be less tenable now. And I think maybe in part because of things like COVID, it's caused us to reflect on our own mortality and so on a bit more. Do you find any of that the case, Len? And... Um, what maybe excites you about our historical moment now, uh, now that you've fi finished the book and so on? Hmm. Uh, a few years ago, it was before COVID, um, I went to see Jordan Peterson speak in person in, in Oxford. And I went on a day that the Facebook reminded me that 10 years earlier, I'd done a debate in Oxford against um, Andrew Copson, the chief executive of the British Humanist Association, and it was sort of right in the middle of the the new atheist moment and it was a lecture theater it was absolutely rammed full of people it was people standing up around the edges of the room and and out into the corridor and it was a very febrile atmosphere and i was one of the only christians in the room and i i i'm i've got a perverse personality because i i quite liked that it was, it was <laughs> i found it quite enjoyable and especially because when Q&A came, all the questions were for me. And so I, I just got to speak for quite quite a long time, actually. But that was 10 years earlier. That must have been like 2009 or something. And then 10 years on, 
I was in Oxford again and I actually saw one of the guys um, who was at the debate, who was one of the, the angriest atheists and, and he's, he was now a massive sort of Peterson fan, right? And he jumped onto that bandwagon and, and I'm not saying that necessarily means, you know, he's uh, headed for the kingdom, but he's in a very different place and, you know, and look across the room and there's Alex O'Connor, otherwise known as um, Cosmic Skeptic, the, the big atheist YouTuber and he's sort of listening in and 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 I think even when you look at an Alex O'Connor as a, an atheist YouTuber, I think he's in a different position to someone like a, a Christopher Hitchens, who was a massive influence on on Alex and continues to be a, an influence on Alex. But he's in a different place and he's making different arguments. And, and um, I think we've 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 got over that moment of Im imagining uh, ourselves to be these uh, sort of rational decision makers who are ascending just just through our rationality um, to a place of just greater liberality. I, mean, it's, I, I just think economically and um, existentially when when COVID comes and smashes through and, and economic downturn comes and, and has its way with us, um, that's we, we recognize that those were sort of luxury beliefs, really, in in lots of senses. Um, and people are just so much more interested in hearing, in inhabiting strange new worlds. And um, there's a real space for that online, and lots of online communities that that allow for that. And and there's a real hunger for that in person as well. And I think that makes me excited as a Christian because, you know, we believe in the strange new world of the Bible, which is weird and wonderful. Um, and it means that there's a massive place for the church, which is also weird and wonderful and incarnate and strange. And I think everyone is recognizing that um, we do not, more and more people are recognizing we do not navigate the world according to reason and evidence. And more and more people are recognizing that we live in a storied world and we've got to have one and we've lost our story. And more and more people are recognizing the story that has woven us together is the Jesus story. And I'm, I'm saying just in our, in our home church, lots of people are showing up and just, you know, a, a guy who I met at the school gates just said, well, I guess um, the Bible's built our society. I, I guess I'd better find out what it's all about, hadn't I? I guess I'd better. And, and so, um, you know, and so he, he wants to come to church. And that's, I think there's, there is a way back in our post-Christian moment. Um, there, is, there is a way back to Christian faith. And, and people are taking it in dribs and drabs. Who knows what impact that will have at a cultural level? In a sense, I'm not as interested in whether the thought leaders that are covered in mainstream media um, make that journey. I'm much more interested in whether this guy at the school gates does, and I'm seeing that happen. So I'm, I'm encouraged. No, that's excellent. Thank you, Len. And um, you've got that minister's heart that I see in figures like Paul Vander lately as well. I think that's um, a beautiful quality to have. And um, I'm kind of curious then building upon that, what do you think then, I don't know, to make you put on your prophet hat, what do you think some of the major challenges it might be that Christians will face in the coming decade or further, say, in the English-speaking part of the church? And um, maybe does that look the same, do you think, as the majority world church, as uh, Dr. Timothy Tennant describes? Or you don't have to speak on that. But <laughs> any thoughts on that? Mm. I think we've all got very different challenges. Um, I'm just very aware that um, the nature of YouTube, I'm sure you can find the, the same that when it comes to a Christian audience, um, there are so many more American Christians who can access your stuff as, as seamlessly as they can access, you know, as, as any Brit can access your stuff. And, and so actually our, our channel is listened to as much by Americans as it is by the UK. And I'm just very aware that even these two very similar countries um, just have very different needs, very different histories, and probably will have very different futures. Um, and so in one sense, 
you know, I, I, I think we should learn the lessons from all over the world um, in terms of the the church is advancing in so many different environments. The seed is growing on so many different soils um, that actually it, it just gives you a, a hope that the seed itself is good um, rather than certain conditions needing to be needing to be there. What do I think about my little corner of um, of the Christian world? Um, I, I I've been really encouraged by Kate Forbes losing the um, uh, the, the the leadership um, uh, contest for for the Scottish National Party. Um, she's a you know Christian member of the um, Free Church of Scotland. And was absolutely grilled by the media on all sorts of Christian views that she held. And a lot of people are saying she didn't get the job because <clears throat> she's a Christian. But then as soon as Hamza Yusuf becomes the first minister, he takes, you know, pictures of him leading his family in Muslim prayer in Holyrood. And that goes out on social media. And you just see, you know, you can just see the rest of the world going, oh, there's lots of people who are very different. And they and if I really believe in diversity. <laughs> Then that means okay, Muslim prayer in Holyrood, and and we're not so much of a hypocrite that um that we then won't allow Christian prayer to happen. I don't think right. If we're if we're happy with diversity for everybody except a member of the Free Church of Scotland, I I, I think people are cottoning on that um, diversity and inclusion might mean diversity and inclusion even of Christians. Um, <laughs> And the fact that we've got a Muslim, you know, first minister of Scotland and a Hindu prime minister, I think it makes it so much easier for Christian ministry in this in this country. Because we are we are not the establishment who are stopping people from coming our way. We say, no, don't go this way. Don't go there. We're stopping you. We're stopping you. I think we're far more out of the way of of cultural power. And we just sort of let people go. Oh, you want to you want to go that way towards the sinking sand? Okay, we'll be over here on the rock, and we're ready whenever you want to take refuge from the storms <laughs> that, that are upon us. Um, and I think that's just a much more healthy position for the church to be in, and, and I think we'll see a lot more fruitfulness than if we try and take up our positions of cultural power and and try to direct people in that way. Mm. God willing, thank you for that, Glenn. And uh, then, personally, is there anything else that you're working on at present that you still feel the, the passion, or that you still feel the passion to get involved with in the future that you'd like to tell us about? So, I've been passionate for twelve years about a gospel presentation I've um, developed called Three Two One, and it's it's about the weird and wonderful world of the Bible, basically. Um, and that the whole idea is I'm not trying to like build stepping stones from from the secular world into the biblical worldview. It's basically we open up the doors to this ramshackle but wonderful kind of edifice called the church, and I give the grand tour and. And I don't minimize the weirdness. And so three refers to God's threeness, Father, Son, and Spirit. So we go into Trinity. Um, and then two is about this two Adam understanding of the world. The first Adam takes us down to death and curse. The second Adam, Christ, um, lasts a hole through death and comes out the other side. And, and then one is you're born one with Adam, be one with Jesus. And so talking about Trinity. Trinity, Adam and Christ in union with Christ. It is not boiling Christianity down to to a, a thin gruel. It is really giving the richest, most basic explanation of the faith. It's the creeds, basically, right? The, the creeds go into these doctrines. And so, but I'm just saying lots of people are they're up for something that is deep, um, but that also gets to the heart of Christian faith. And and so three two one it was a book it's been a course it's been little videos it's it's been all sorts of different things and we're releasing it um, for an, for an online audience in September in a way that's going to be really interactive and and intuitive so that you can just do it by yourself and sort of be guided through the eight episodes and um, and yeah be introduced to the weird and wonderful world of Jesus and I I hope. I hope that it gets into the hands of loads of non-Christians. But as I said right at the beginning, I really hope it evangelizes Christians too. 
and shows us a much rich, richer, much deeper, much more profound, much more captivating gospel so that from the overflow of the heart that we go out and speak of Jesus. Beautiful. Thanks, Len. And I suppose just to close up then, where can viewers or listeners uh, find out more about you and your work then? Yeah, so you can go to speaklife.org.uk, speaklife.org.uk, or you can follow me on Twitter at Glenn Scrivener. Thank you so much for your time today, Glenn. God bless you, Marcus.